Welcome. If you're an inventor and you've had your eye on scuba diving, you've come to the right place. My wife and I have dedicated about one third of our trips across the world to scuba diving because there's so much to see underneath the ocean. It has opened new doors across the world for us to see underneath the ocean. Scuba diving has changed my life and love for adventure and I know it will for you too. This video is dedicated for those who are just starting to learn scuba diving or have a little bit of experience and wanting to know more. In this video, we'll explore the experience, getting certified, types of scuba dives and types of divers, the gear, scuba tips for beginners. But first, let me introduce myself. I'm Don, and if you love travel and adventure, you've come to the right channel, where I share tips and experiences to help make sure that your next trip is a wonder to behold. Make sure you smash that like button and help this video grow and be shared to others. And also, if you want to check out my future adventures, maybe join me for an adventure, check out my subreddit, I'll link it in the link below. All right, let's start off by talking about the experience of scuba diving. Scuba diving utilizes modern technology to allow you to explore underwater without utilizing a submarine. Since the body is not well optimized to explore the ocean, we don't have fins and gills to breathe underneath the water, using scuba technology, you have unlimited freedom with the physical constraints of your body and the physics of the air you breathe to explore the ocean. Mistakes in scuba diving could cost you your life. However, there is rigorous training certifications involved that will help prepare you and make sure you make the right choices under the stress and circumstances. All right, let's talk about some of the highlights of scuba diving. For one, you'll get to see interesting sea life from whales, mantas, sharks, rays, all sorts of fish life, and some interesting fish that farm, fish that interact with you. It's, it's truly a sight to behold. I can't speak to the amazing things you will see underneath the water. And it's amazing to see how intelligent animals underneath the ocean can be when they interact with you. And there's other amazing things to see, such as shipwrecks, caves, caverns, sea mountains, and coral reefs. I can guarantee when you start to scuba dive, the things you will see, will, you will remember for the rest of your life. All right, next, let's talk about getting certified as a scuba diver. Getting a valid diving certificate is necessary. Most insurances require it, and most everywhere you dive will check to make sure you have open water certification. It also gives you the fundamentals to make sure you can recreational dive safely. There are many big diving certification companies, but two of the biggest are PADI and SSI. We personally got certified through SSI, but both are good, and if you get certified, your certificate will be accepted across the world. The courses for open water certificate will generally last three days and require you to attend a classroom to learn a lot of the basics and also read a big book, so be prepared for lots of reading. You'll have a course in the pool and two dives in open water, at least two dives. And then you'll have the final exam, as long as you can pass, but generally they do set it up and prepare you to pass that final exam. But as long as you pass, you'll have your open water certificate by the end of it. There are several other courses that will help prepare you for the fundamentals of scuba diving that I'd like to recommend. In particular, advanced scuba diving. It doesn't necessarily make you an advanced scuba diver, but what it will do is pound in the fundamentals from the open water certificate. I highly recommend doing it shortly after your open water certificate because you'll find it adds less value over time. It will also help you get on board some more advanced trips on boats. Uh, they will require it and so you have to show your advanced open water as well. The advanced will go over a lot of base skills such as navigation, buoyancy control, and a lot of other things that you may have touched upon in the open water, but it'll go into a lot more depth and really get a lot more refinement out of those and specifically tutoring your form. And that's why you also need a really good instructor. So find one that seems like they have a lot of experience, not someone who's early in their career and can teach you a lot because it's really kind of like personal instruction uh, in that advanced open water course will have that personal instructor looking at your form and giving you a lot of recommendations and making sure in the future you're, you learn a lot of your base fundamentals as, as well as you can and you'll be more prepared for future dives. Other good courses I highly recommend is getting your deep diving certificate, your nitrox certificate, and also 
dry suit certificate for cold water diving. The reason why you want your nitrox is it'll help increase your dive time when you're down at depths of 25 to 30 meter and you'll be able to stay down there longer than you would on air. Usually when you dive down, you'll see on your dive watch that's already counting down, you maybe have 10 minutes and, and, it, and that number will continue to get smaller. You can generally double that time with nitrox, giving you longer bottom time at that depth. But what's important is nitrox doesn't allow you to dive as deep as you would with air. And there's also some other semantics around nitrox that you'll learn in the dive course. And the deep diving is of course something you'll want to have for insurance purposes. So what's important is recreational diving with open water or particularly advanced open water will only allow you to dive down to 30 meters. And honestly, you'll probably want to dive down a little bit deeper net, uh, down to 40 meters. And you can't with just advanced. You need a deep, wider, deep water diving certificate in order for insurances to cover you down to 40 meters. You won't go below 40 meters. That's as deep as you want to go for recreational diving. And, and so at least with the deep diving, you'll be able to go through the full, uh, full range. And at least with the deep diving certificate, you'll be able to experience the full range of the recreational diving. Up next, we'll talk about the different types of scuba dives and divers. Now the running joke is there's two types of divers. There's technical divers and everyone else. <laughs> and you'll get this when you start scuba diving more, but you'll meet technical divers and they're a different uh, type of breed because they have to be. When you're doing technical dives or cave dives, it is a different extreme than recreational diving. And you have to do things a very particular way. You have to have certain gear. You have to have certain form. If you don't, your life could be at risk. And you have to do things in a very specific way. Now, as a beginner, as a recreational diver, you might find a lot of stuff very intimidating and it might turn you away. And so the important thing is you're there to have fun. You're there to learn the basics and start with recreational diving. So don't allow any of that to intimidate you and gate you from getting into the open water and recreational diving experience. Recreational diving is fun. It, it can be very safe as, and I've known a lot of people have done it their whole lives. And it can for you as well, once you learn the basics and, and learn how to be a recreational diver. And I, I in particular, am a recreational diver. I don't have technical diving and I and I maybe I will someday, but I don't really have there's so much to see in the recreational dive zones. And I haven't experienced a small fraction of it yet and I still plan to continue to do so. And so most of my experience is in the recreational zone. I've done over 350 dives now and I'm still going. And so technical diving maybe someday, but I enjoy recreational diving and you can too. But let's talk about technical and cave diving. Like I said, it's a different extreme. These types of dives are not for beginners. These are very advanced, but you must know to be able to succeed at cave diving and technical diving, you need a considerable amount of education and experience to be able to handle those safely. And so I generally won't recommend it at this stage, but the importance is when you get to be a more advanced diver and you have a lot of dives under your belt and you're interested in becoming a technical and cave diver, Patty, and there's actually organizations that even excel at technical diving instruction much better than Patty that you might be interested in exploring and they'll be able to prepare you for types of experiences. Let's talk about night diving. Night diving happens in shallow water where you'll be comfortable. It's either a very safe zone or you have a lot of experience diving there in the past. You will see things that you normally won't see during the daytime because the light scares away creatures from the deep. And so when it's dark, they come up. And these creatures can be highly bioluminescent, uh, things like squids and uh, there's just so many things that look like UFOs. It is quite a, uh, amazing to see. And you and your torch will go and find all sorts of interesting things. And also hunting. Some animals hunt more at nighttime than daytime. So you'll be able to see different behaviors from the sea life. Also worth noting, but it's more advanced is black water diving. It's much like night diving, except for it won't be in shallow water. It'll be in a channel where you won't be able to see the bottom and you'll have a much better chance of seeing those creatures from the deep. Even bigger creatures start coming up and this is more advanced because you'll be totally lost. You 
your senses are all messed up. You don't know which way's which, and it's very easy to get confused. And so there's much less light, and everything looks like a flying saucer around you. It can be quite the experience, but definitely not for beginners. Freshwater and high altitude diving require a little bit different finesse than you would in open water because the buoyancy is going to be a little bit different and your 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 dive time tables will be a little bit different. So you will have to make sure on your dive computer that you input that you're diving in fresh water and proceed accordingly. And not to forget that the altitude is very important too. And you have to make sure you set that up in your dive watch or make sure you set that up in your timetables accordingly as well. Cold water diving. Cold water diving is generally anything 50 degrees or below. The heating dynamics change considerably in cold water diving. How your wetsuit works is it slows down the water permeation towards your skin and your body will heat up that water normally in a natural rate to keep you warm enough. And so if you're keeping warm water next to your skin long enough, then you'll generally stay warm. But in cold water, you'll find that no matter how much, your, your heat is not enough to keep you warm. And that's why you need extra measures and that's called a dry suit. A dry suit is basically a suit that you wear and it forms an air bubble. So the, the water is no longer, no longer next to your skin and you're basically a marshmallow puff man with this big old air bubble around you that keeps you warm. And there's a whole bunch of different things you have to be careful with the dry suit in terms of dispersing the air in your suit, doing these, these rolls and dispersing the air and also making sure that you have air in it so you don't have the dry suit squeeze. There's a bunch of extra considerations. Dry suit diving is a little bit different level, but it's not too bad once you get the hang of it and, and uh, it's important for cold water diving. Next, cavern and wreck diving. Shipwreck diving can be very cool. You'll see the big hole of the ship and sometimes they are, these are big ships and you can penetrate fairly deeply into them, but you have to be careful Penetrating deeply into them is more an advanced diving thing and you have to make sure you have a line so you can retrace yourself out. Uh, but it's always okay to stay on the, uh, outside of it and observe. If you know what you're doing, you can penetrate in. Cavern diving is when you're close to the surface in these cave-like structures, but you can see in some areas light penetrating through. They're really cool and when you see the light shimmering through into the open water it is it is amazing but to note both cavern and shipwreck diving require strong buoyancy control otherwise you'll be bouncing all over the place and so you have to stay calm you have to stay stable you have to have good trim and what trim is is when you get to a certain depth you can pin yourself there with your air your breathing technique and you don't shift around much and so it's very important before you start exploring these that you have good buoyancy control otherwise you'll be bouncing off the walls or you'll in, in cavern diving if you're there's a silty bottom you'll just you'll just hit the sand and it'll just blow up and no one can see anything it'll just be like a blackout which is not fun for anyone because you generally are there to see things all right let's talk about the basics of scuba gear starting with the goggles. I generally keep them in a hard case and the reason why you might want to do that is so they don't get smashed or broken in travel and so it just works out fairly well and I also keep my dive computer in the same case so for the same reason it doesn't get smashed and and the goggles pretty straightforward honestly the most important thing that you want in a goggle is that it's a single pane sometimes you'll see goggles I'm probably gonna get a little closer here Sometimes you'll see goggles, they have a separation in the center here, and this is called a double pane. A single pane is when it has a single lens all the way through. What's a really nice feature about this is that when you're scuba diving, you can lift one of the corners, allow some water in, and be able to clean the full lens and purge it all at once. If, if you have a two pane, that means you have to do it for once each side. It's just, single panes is so much easier. The most important thing is the fit. And so you can test the fit generally without the strap. And so the most, I've even seen sc some scuba divers dive without a strap at all, which is kind of amazing. But that means you have a really good fit of the goggles. So what you wanna do is just press on your face and then breathe out. And ideally, of course this maybe is because I have some facial hair, I usually shave before I scuba dive. But ideally this sucks to your face. If you breathe in a little bit, 
it'll just say on your face and stuck there. You won't have to worry about falling off. Next, let's talk about the dive watch. This is one of the more important things that you want to buy and I would highly recommend at least buying a goggle and your own dive watch. And that way you're covered even if you rent the rest of the gear, especially when you start trying to figure out if you want to continue uh, scuba diving. The dive watch is something you'll want because it's very personal to you. If you go and rent at different dive shops, you will be missing a lot. So you'll either have to write down and track everything with pen and paper on your own timetables like you'll learn in the open water course, or you can just use a dive watch. And this does all of those calculations for you and make sure that you, uh, you're you not being over overly uh, again, I talk about the decompression sickness, and this will make sure that you're not at risk of decompression sickness, and also it gets, it keeps track of your flight, uh, when you can fly, and all that good stuff. And so, keep one, and if you're transferring different dive shops, it's not calculating the correct information for you. That's why you will want to have one of these, and make sure that you just wear this all the time when you're diving and it keeps track of your personal information for that dive trip or the session of dives that you're doing. Next we have the snorkel. So a snorkel is a normal part of the kit and you, if you're a snorkeler you're very familiar with this thing and there's a whole not too much technology involved. Uh, I'm not going to go too much in detail on these things because they're optional for scuba diving. In fact I really don't use one because there's not a strong reason to have this on the surface. If you're going to be on the surface and swimming a long distance, it might be comfortable to have one of these. But if you don't plan on swimming a long distance on the surface, then you probably don't need it. You know, often when the water, this thing's just kind of dangling and it'll smack you in the face on occasion and we're trying to get on the boat, it'll just, I don't know. It, it's usually not worth it. Uh, but like I said, it has this use and uh, particularly when you're on the surface of the water. Next up, let's talk about weight control, or rather a weight belt. You generally, when you're starting off, you'll have all sorts of uh, weight belts, and generally, like especially if you're renting, it's gonna be very primitive. It's gonna be like this fabric, except for all the way around. Uh, I eventually bought one of these, which is, it's a compartmentalized uh, weight belt, and so this just is amazing because you can distribute the weights across five different pockets. I do recommend five pockets, by the way, if you buy one. Uh, so you can put one in the center, you can put one on the sides, you can put them on, if you just have two weights, you can put them here, and you can really have a really good uh, control of your weight on your belt. Uh, this, the nice thing about putting weight on the belt is it's right in the middle of your body. It gives you some options of being able to, if your fins are more buoyant or your, your top is more buoyant, it's just kind of, it's a nice place for weight to be. However, one of the things, more advanced pieces of uh, weight control is figuring out where to put the weights. We'll go into that topic in another video. But what's not, I just want to introduce the weight belt and if you do plan on getting your own, these are really nice. Next up, let's talk about fins. So generally, these are a pain to travel with. They have some really cool newer technology that uh, basically detaches here at the center and you can put these together. Uh, makes it much more travelable and you can kind of see mine are deforming a little bit. I've used these quite a bit. Uh, what's important about fins is uh, scuba fins are different than snorkel fins and the most important thing to see is that they have a compartment here and something when you have all your gear on the last thing you want to be messing with is is having to <laughs> you'll, you'll see snorkel fins generally are around and they uh, attach to your foot without, uh, and they, they're really close to your foot. You generally don't want to scuba dive with those because uh, you'll be finning so much under the water, they will literally rub the skin right off of your foot. That, it's happened to me before and it's very unpleasant, trust me. Um, so you'll generally use a boot. You'll put a boot on and this is just much easier to put on. It gives you a little bit of warmth and you'll put the boot on and you'll be able to stuff your foot right in there as as so and take this strap and this is another really nice feature there's a whole bunch of different mechanisms to to attach your your fin to your foot uh, but this is called the, uh, the the strap and you'll generally just have it right underneath your foot like this and when your foot's in there you'll just grab it and yank it right over and it stays just like that and this works wonderful there's some other kind of straps that will be kind of clips and such and uh, I generally don't like those. These are my favorite, but anyways, 
There's a whole bunch of different types of fins, and there's different finning styles. And I'm just wondering, that's probably a topic for another video because there's a whole bunch to talk to there. And uh, there's a whole bunch of arguments in that space of finning styles and different types of fins. And we're not gonna get into that now. But these are good fins, I've used these. The, they're more for flutter kicking. Uh, and so depending on your fitting style and your preferred choices, uh, these work very well, especially in current conditions. And so I'm not a stranger to some intense current and I really like these for uh, more current dives. Next up, let's talk about the safety sausage. The SMB or safety sausage is important as when you're going up and ending your dive, you'll want to be able to put this thing up. And what's in, uh, in other boats, especially the boat you might be on, will be able to see where you're surfacing, which is very important because when you're surfacing too and you may lose track of your dive site, there's current and such moving away, you want the other boats to be able to see you, make sure they don't run over you, and also your boat to see you to know where you're going if you're in current. And so often they'll be labeled like diver below uh, and, and such. And you'll have this line, which can, they, these lines can be varying length. So you want to make sure to know how long your line is. And that's the max depth you can deploy your SMB. Otherwise it'll pull you up and you don't want that because it's ascending too quickly. And so you'll want to generally put this thing up as soon as you can. And what's nice is it can really control your ascent because you, you'll be sitting there uh, re-wrapping this thing as you're moving towards the top. These things take a lot of practice to uh, get used to. And I'd highly recommend starting early, especially as a beginner, because the more instruction you get, especially if experienced divers, the better you'll get at deploying SMB. SMB is very important. And a lot of people I've met just don't have the skills to do it. So practice often. If you want to practice, and let the master diver you're diving with know, hey, I'm gonna practice deploying my SMB at the end. You you can still deploy yours. I just am gonna practice and maybe I'm a little flaky on it. So, you know, I might mess up a little bit, but I'm gonna keep practicing until I make perfect. They'll be perfectly okay with that. So that that's cool. Just let them know, because if you don't, maybe they might think there's some emergency or something's wrong. It's hard to communicate under the water. So just let them know beforehand. All right, and here we have a regulator and this is what you call an octo or octopus style regulator and I have a DIN connection here and so what's important to know is there's two types of connectors and these go on to your air tank this particular connector is a DIN style connector and it screws into the tank and so these I mean, th uh, these are commonly used in different parts of the world, namely Europe. And then they have the kind of more American style, which is the yoke. And the yoke is a clamp on style. So there's two different types. I go with the DIN and I have a connector, uh, uh, sorry, a adapter. And so pretty much I can use both. Uh, this one Octo can, uh, regulator can connect to both with the adapter. So it's, it's per fairly flexible. If I, as long as I remember to bring the adapter. So that's the different styles between DIN and yoke. Let's talk about what a regulator does. So this little piece here that connects to your tank is called the first stage. It basically works in a mech way that it takes high pressurized air from the tank and makes it breathable. If you try to breathe air from the tank, it's not gonna work. And, and so this takes that highly pressurized air and makes it, uh, it ramps down as the first stage and it'll connect with the second stage regulator. And the second stage is where you breathe out of. And so this is your main mouthpiece and it's what you'll suck air through. And there's a whole bunch of different styles of regulators. I won't get into too much of the details. Uh, but you'll see that mine has two regulators. And this is called the backup second stage, alternative second stage, or octo second stage. You won't be primarily using this one. This is mainly for auxiliary in case this one fails, or if you come across someone who needs air, you can give them this as, as, a, as a backup. Or there's a bunch of different strategies, you know, it's probably not the video for it too, but a lot of people recommend that you give someone your primary and then you take your alternative and suck out of that. Anyways, probably beyond this video. But another important piece of this 
is your air gauge. Your air gauge is very important. This will tell you how much you have air you have left. You'll find some fancy dive watches can sometimes connect and give you a Bluetooth reading of your air. You'll still want an air gauge always for backup at the least. Lastly, of the four little dangling bits of the Octo is this thing. And so this thing connects to the next device I'm gonna show you, which is the BCD or buoyancy control device. And you'll see that this little doodad on the left shoulder uh, has a little plug like this. And that's where this extra cord gets plugged into. I'm not gonna put it in right now, but I just wanted to point that out. And this thing is your control device of the BCD. So you'll see a manual a, a hole that you can blow air into or suck air. So you can blow air into your BCD manually or suck air out through this mechanism here. Also, if I have air in my tank and I have this little guy connected here, then I can use this button to fill my BCD with air from the, my, my tank. And so what is a BCD? A BCD is an air bladder that you can add air into and either become positively buoyant or neutrally buoyant. As with weight and as over time you get deeper, you'll become negatively buoyant and so adding air into your BCD will give you that more positive buoyancy to either hit that neutral or even positively buoyant buoyancy that you need. Some features of the BCD that are important to note is usually you'll have dump valves on the very top and the bottom. You don't want to become over reliant on these but these are super handy just to be able to release the air if you're not totally horizontal in all cases or you have different circumstances where you want to purge the air from your BCD in an emergency. Other features of the BCD are attachment points. You'll have a whole bunch of different places. You'll always have a little bit of dangling things. With scuba diving, you tend to have a bunch of utilities and tools and you'll want them fairly accessible and, and uh, you'll, you'll need to put them somewhere. And so attachment points become really important of where you want to be reaching and finding things as you're scuba diving. You'll also have pockets for, for trim, uh, little, you'll have pockets for little weights to help balance out your trim. And sometimes you'll have integrated weight pockets in the front here. I, these actually have integrated weights, but I take them off. I generally prefer a weight belt or I put them, my weights in the, in the trim pockets here. And by the way, this is a Hydro Scuba Pro, which is a fantastic beginner to intermediate and even advanced uh, BCD that will take you through your recreational diving uh, career and also it's just super highly travel and portable so it, because it breaks down these these uh, attachment points break down and it's just super it folds down really nice so I really like this BCD it's been really good but it's worth noting there's two different type of types of uh, BCDs there's this wing type. This one's kind of a hybrid because it's a little bit bigger than a normal wing, but it's considered a kind of wingish in the way that all of the air bladder sits on your back. Then you'll have jackets, which jackets wrap around you and it gives you that more distributed feel of air. But you'll find once you become good at scuba, do, scuba diving, you'll want a fairly horizontal trim. So you don't want air in front of you. You usually want it on your back so that you can stay fairly horizontal because you want to work towards of becoming, staying horizontal more frequently. So these air bladders will push you down and hold all your air in the back. So these are pretty nice to have versus the jacket style. Jacket style is usually only good for when you're a beginner and you'll see them on rentals often. Equalizing can be the bane of beginner divers, but don't let this stop you. It can be uncomfortable and it can take a while to get used to, but you'll get used to it and eventually you won't even have to worry about it. The hard part, especially beginning, is you'll see more experienced divers not even focused on it. They're just blowing down there with no problem at all. Equalizing becomes like breathing it becomes easier the more you do it. And so when you see them doing it so easily, you might think there's, you might be doing something wrong. And I guarantee you, it's just something you will have to do set over and over again, you'll get more used to it. The most important thing is to take your time. 
Don't let others pressure you. If you try to descend too fast, you'll find it gets harder to equalize. Eventually, you're, you'll be feeling a lot of pain and it'll hurt. And if you get to that point, you have to ascend. And even if you are having a hard time equalizing, what's important is just ascend a little bit. It doesn't have to be a full meter, half meter, just a little bit above. You'll probably find, okay, now I can equalize. I'm starting to equalize again and I can go down. So take your time with it. The important piece of equalizing is how to do it. When you're more advanced, you'll probably be more comfortable and more at ease with scuba diving. That means your body's relaxed and you can probably just like swallow sometimes and start equalizing. You can just be swallowing, no problem. For most and even myself, when I'm trying to equalize fast, I hold my nose and, and kind of blow out. And you'll, if you do this right now, you can even do it on a plane, just hold your nose, plug it, don't breathe through your mouth and blow out. You'll feel the sinuses and pressure releasing from your ears and this is equalizing. It's just practice it some and when you're scuba diving, the most important thing is start doing it immediately and often while you're descending. If you find you can't do it, ascend a little bit. With all things, practice makes perfect and you have to practice this one quite a bit. Within 20, 10 to 20 dives, you will find equalizing is no longer one of the things you worry about. The next tip is avoid ascending quickly. This might sound a little obvious for those who've taken open water training, but I want to pound in the reasons why you need to avoid ascending quickly. While scuba diving, as you breathe, you'll be absorbing air and nitrogen with it. And normally, that's perfectly fine. Nitrogen is one of those elements that you breathe and it will naturally seep out and degas from your body over time. However, to note, it's important that you degas over time. And so, trying to ascend too quickly causes this nitrogen to try and seep out at a much more rapid pace. Kind of think of what happens when a, you shake up a bottle of Pepsi to the point where it starts fizzing. You might see that it starts expanding and all that pressure is trying to release. Imagine that is your nitrogen in your bloodstream and starting to fizz in your body. What happens is that nitrogen will rip and tear its way through your body to try and find ways out if you try to ascend too fast. So if you were to go straight to the top of Mealy, imagine all that fizzing and your soda can and that fizz is exploding your body. <laughs> so not a pretty picture, but that kind of hopefully paints the picture for you of why it's important. And so you ascend very slowly and this nitrogen will seep out naturally through the normal means your body expels it. Also, it's important to note that ascending and descending too quickly can cause what you call air bubbles to form or rather nitrogen bubbles. And those can kind of be pesky little bubbles that stay in your tissue in some areas and this is really kind of a fine science of how to make sure you avoid those nitrogen bubbles from forming. However, to note, the most important thing when you're diving is to always descend slowly, ascend slowly, have a dive plan, stick to that dive plan. If you're going up and down, especially at depth, you will find that there's you're encouraging these nitrogen bubbles to form. And so if you're trying to ascend too quickly, these nitrogen bubbles can cause issues uh, in your body over time but they are not permanent. They will naturally go away as long as you give it time. This whole thing is called decompression sickness or as some call it, the bends, and it can be fatal or damaging to your body. A good rule of thumb for ascending is if you are ascending faster in your bubbles, you're going way too fast. I would say try not to ascend more than half the speed of your bubbles. You're probably on the mark. You generally wanna take your time with ascending, just like a climber climbing, you don't want to fall. <laughs> Same with thing with diver. You don't want to ascend without control. Next, let's talk about weight control. As a beginner, a lot of dive masters will put more weight than you need on your belt or in your suit to make sure that you are more prominent as sinking than ascending due to the concern of decompression sickness. However, it's important to note the faster you get a handle of how much weight you need, the better you can start accurately putting the correct amount of weight in. So make sure you learn the weight you need and start adjusting it and taking control of that because if you 
tell someone, hey, I have no idea how much weight there I need, they're gonna give you way more than you need, I guarantee it. A good rule of thumb is before you start diving, either or on the first dive, you'll do a check dive. And on the check dive is a perfect time to do a test at the very surface and try and predict how much weight you need, put it all on your, on your gear and see if you can sink from the surface. If you can sink, no problem. You have enough weight to get down. But the key is you don't wanna sink too fast. In fact, you can, if you have a full breath of air, you should be still able to bob on the surface. And, and if you just empty your lungs, you should be able to slip just underneath the surface very slowly. This is good weight. And if you nailed it, then you will have good buoyancy control as you can continue to dive. And an important thing to know of why you need good weight control is that buoyancy control. And buoyancy control is your ability to have a good trim, as I mentioned earlier, be able to staple yourself to a certain depth and be able to not bob up and down. And so the better your trim, the, the better your buoyancy control, you'll just kind of sit there at a depth and, and be able to stay horizontal even. And so with that said, what I've seen a lot of beginners do is when they have too much weight, they over lie on the BCD and that's not where you want to be. I see just like shh, putting a lot of air in that BCD and, and just constantly fiddling with the BCD. And so you're just always fiddling with BCD, trying to find that good, uh, good measure. Honestly, I don't use the BCD hardly at all. So when I dive, I will enter the water, go down to my planned depth, let's say it's 30 meter, and as soon as I get there, I will start seeing where my neutral buoyancy is. And you just tap the BCD, uh, the, in, the air intake button, uh, just enough to get enough air in that BCD that now you start hitting neutral buoyancy. And so what I call neutral buoyancy is when you breathe up in and out, you want about half lung full and you can pin that, pin your depth. And so if you breathe in, you'll be able to go up. If you breathe out, you'll be able to go down. And so when I hit 30 meters, I will breathe about halfway in and try and add just enough air. And usually it's about like a really quick press on the BCD. It's like puff and then done. That's all I need. And then I'll just try and test. Like I will see where my buoyancy is and I should be able to be fairly neutrally buoyant about half in. And so if I breathe in more, I go up. If I breathe down, I go, uh, I go down. And so now I have very fine control of my buoyancy and it's now just my breathing that changes it. And it's important to know when you dive deep, you will become negatively buoyant, more negatively buoyant. And so the deeper you are, the, the faster you'll sink, which is kind of interesting. Another consideration is when your air tank starts getting lighter on air, you're running less and less air, you'll also get positive buoyancy because the air takes a little bit of buoyancy as well. And so you will actually gain positive buoyancy as your air tank gets low. So what I'm trying to say is buoyancy control is not something you kind of just go down to 30 meter deal with once. You'll constantly be able to adjust it. But when you do adjust it, like I said, diving is about plan. I'm planning to go down to 30 meter. I'm gonna pin there and for probably a good 10, 15 minutes, maybe 30 minutes, I won't have to really adjust too much. Maybe if I'm going a little bit deeper, I see something or I'm going up, I'll start trying to let some air out. Eventually, I don't need any air in the BCD and I can just control things with my lungs. In some cases, you'll find you may not have enough weight on you. If your tank is getting low and you're finding it hard to do your safety stop. Basically, you're swimming down. This means you probably wanna add a little bit of weight. So just take note on the technique to test for neutral buoyancy with that mid lung halfway full. And if you're going, if you're still sinking, you might need to add a small puff of air to the BCD. Don't over rely on it. If you're going up and you have mid lung, then maybe you probably wanna add a little bit of weight to your weight belt. And this should only happen at the surface. If you're deep and this is happening, then you really, uh, you really didn't have enough weight. <laughs> Woo, that's a lot of stuff we went over in this crash course of beginning scuba diving. I really hope you uh, learned something today. If you're interested in scuba diving, I think it's just wonderful for people to explore. And 
And uh, if you have any questions, please leave a comment below. If you'd like me to go into more detail about any subject, more intermediate or advanced topics, I'm happy, happy to do so. Feel free to just ask your questions and have a wonderful day. Take care.